Parvatibhai. I think my biggest CV is that I have been associated with all teaching programs of Bangladesh for more than a decade or so. So yes, I consider that as my up. main CV. No, yes, I was sir, told are... to I was told to speak on acute coronary syndrome. At the same time, I was told that one should not go in very advanced thing or so, but just a basic understanding from a clinical cardiologist point of view. Now I know most of my images will be moving, but sometimes we have to go up and down to see. So, but I will try to finish within forty-five minutes or so. Now, the acute acute coronary syndrome. The problem is that we need immediate action to identify why, because time is the greatest agent in increasing the occlusive thrombus. Hence, early diagnosis is extremely important. And there are three basic facts for the basic clinical cardiologist to understand the topic or so. What does echo pick up? Echo picks up any ischemia or injury at the time of examination. I have made it bold at the time of examination, and this is manifested as a visceral wall motion abnormality, which is mainly characterized by a decreased systolic thickening of the wall. Myocardial segment, any ischemic segment, it tends to show a decreased systolic thickening, which is the most important part, and that that is what what echo picks up at the time of examination. Why is echo helpful in early diagnosis? Yes, because the value of early diagnosis is it improves the rate of coronary artery patency, it improves myocardial salvage, it improves patient survival. And ultimately prevents acute adverse remodeling. As you know, the remodeling is a term which means a change in shape, size, and function of any structure. So that is, this acute remodeling is very bad for the for the patient. It prevents an acute remodeling or so. So how is this echo helpful in early diagnosis? We have known why should it be done, why they there, but how is it helpful in early diagnosis? As most of you know. That whenever there is a coronary artery occlusion, whether experimentally or whether a disease or so, within few seconds, first the thing which occurs is a perfusion defect. That means the area that supplied by the coronary artery suffers from a perfusion defect, which can be easily picked up by what is known as a myocardial contrast echo and some other technologies which help in the picking of this earliest myocardial perfusion segment. Then the diastolic filling abnormality, systolic wall motion abnormality. So, so all these changes occur much earlier, and easily the changes just gain a rise in cardiac markers. They appear much later. That means echo is extremely helpful in the early diagnosis. I will put up I just one word about diastolic abnormality. Sometimes we have heard the word angina equivalent. One of the mechanism of angina equivalent is that when there is a significant diastolic abnormality because of acute ischemia, it increases the mean left atrial pressure. This left atrial pressure is transmitted to the pulmonary vein, and then it leads to certain respiratory symptoms because of this bad pressure. And these respiratory symptoms are known as an angina equivalent if there is no angina or so. So the most important thing is a systolic wall motion abnormality, and this is how a normal wall motion looks like. You see the left ventricle. You see every segment shows a systolic thickening. You can see here it is thickened as a result of which the size of the LV cavity decreases because in systole the all the walls come together with a good systolic thickening. As you as compared to this, if you see here. There is a complete absence of systolic thickening in the distal part of the septum also. So this is known as a regional wall motion abnormality. Of course, we'll come to it subsequently later also. So these points to show is that one must look for these regional wall motion abnormalities, especially decrease in the systolic thickening. Now there are various methods to assess the acute coronary syndrome also. All advanced of the recent methods. But we are today mainly concerned with a two-dimensional echo because that is what a basic cardiologist is exposed to. So these are actually all very complicated or so. But it is being done 
but that is not the topic of discussion today. So there are some of the important role of echo. Now what we will discuss something is, is the diagnosis which is most important, how it is helpful in various diagnosis, complications and some of these factors which will be seen. But before that, it will always be advisable to know some brief about the segments and the coronary supply. So that will help you in understanding the subject. Now this is a parasite and a long axis view. This is the interventricular septum which is supplied by the left anterior descending. This is known as inferior lateral wall. Previously, this was known as a posterior wall, but now it is known as the inferior lateral. Inferior means that this wall, inferior means right coronary, lateral means circumflex. So sometimes this can be a, this can be supplied either by a right coronary artery or by a sub by a circumflex artery. So this inferior lateral wall sub is supplied by this. Now this is this is how you look like LV. This is the interventricular septum. This is anterior lateral wall. The basal and part of the mid segments are supplied by the right coronary artery. And sometimes there may be overlapping by left anterior descending. And the and the late and the distal and part of the mid sometimes can be supplied by left anterior descending. Then this is the anterior lateral wall. You can see a good solid thickening. This is mainly supplied by the circumflex artery and sometimes the apical segment can be supplied by the left anterior descending. Then this is a three chamber view you can see. This is the anterior septum. This is supplied by the left anterior descending. And this is the inferior lateral wall which is, which is mainly supplied by the, by the circumflex artery. And this is a two chamber view. This is the anterior wall supplied by the left anterior descending and this is an inferior wall supplied by the right coronary artery. This inferior apical segment sometimes can be supplied by, by either a LAD or a right coronary artery. So you see the LAD, LAD is trying to supply most of the muscles of the myocardium. That is the reason that the LAD lesions are much more uh, severe as compared to the other lesions especially the left circumflex artery. So these are the basic uh, coronary supply which you help in the later parts of the talk and you can again see a good systolic thickening all over. So now when we discuss an acute coronary syndrome, we discuss in some of these aspects also. First coming to the emergency room, you know this, this, emer this emergency room is the first contact of all critical ill patients and echo is very important because of its portability and giving an immediate diagnosis so that the first equipment which goes to the emergency lab is the, is the echo machine. And if there were early identification is very important. We get patients of an acute coronary syndrome with atypical chest pain, non-diagnosis ECG, normal cardiac enzymes. So in these some of the situations, the time for a timely treatment, the echo plays a very significant role. For example, this was a 46-year-old individual, diabetic and hypertensive, reported with atypical chest pain in the emergency, but was pain-free at the time of echo in, in emergency room. So here you see, this was when the echo was done initially, you see the left ventricle, here a four-chamber view, and this is a two-chamber view, and all the wall, all segments are moving normally, there is a normal systolic thickening of all these segments also. So possibly this patient would have been discharged from there as an atypical chest pain. But because history was slightly suggestive, so, so a, a hand grip was given because that was one of the methods we used to employ many years back and that produced a similar chest discomfort. And as you see, this is the resting phase. And now what happens after a chest discomfort, he developed a decreased systolic thickening into the, into the territory of the left anterior descending. You see here, there is a good systolic thickening of the interventricular septum, but here you see after this, there is a decreased systolic thickening and achanasia. So that gave us a diagnosis that we are dealing with a LAD lesion. At the same time, you see, whenever you see any ischemic episode, always see the left ventricle size has increased as compared to the basal portion. You see this base 
and you see here the left ventricular size has increased. Again, you see in the under view, you see this was a resting view, what we showed you earlier, normal. Now here you see the LV size is increased and there is a kinesi of the inferior apical segment, which can also be supplied by the left anterior descending. So that this patient gave us a diagnosis that we are dealing, it was not the atypical chest pain, but because of an extensive coronary artery disease, which could have been missed and the patient was sent directly to the cath lab. Now, you, you know this patient had a transient dilatation of the LV cavity and when they did transient ischemic LV cavity dilatation, there is usually a very sensitive marker of a severe and extensive angiographic coronary artery disease. In one of the studies, it was found that those who had a transient ischemic LV dilatation, about 19% had a the higher risk of cardiac events as compared to those with no dilatation, which was 2.9%. So that whenever you see any wall motion abnormality, always see for any uh, LV dilatation, and we normally see for LV function and other things also. Another patient in an emergency, 56-year-old male, diabetic, non-hypertensive, no past history of manifest CAD, routine ECG for a pre-operative evaluation. He was undergoing a surgery. The pre-operative evaluation showed a left bundle branch clock. And here you see a, a classical signs of, this is a resting phase, to see a classical signs of left bundle branch clock in the form of a junky and asynchronous motion of the interventricular septum and the lateral wall. But still you see there are good systolic thickening. Then when we gave a some sort of an exercise or a or a hand grip, you see again without doing anything, the distal part of the of the septum supplied by LAD shows a decreased systolic thickening and an achanasia. So as you see here, it is completely showing a normal. Interior descending artery also. So this is the value of this condition in the, in, in, now. Now, can we thrombolize on patients on basis of echo? No. Although we have seen wall more normality, because the basis of a thrombolysis is usually an ECG criteria, not an echo criteria only, and that is a ST elevation away, which can be two millimeters or more in men and 1.5 millimeter in women also. So that it's based only on an echo finding. One cannot know the thrombolyze or so, but because regional wall motion can also be present in a non-ST elevation MI in which you don't give any any sort of a thrombolytic therapy so that we don't leave somebody, it's not, they never be over enthusiastic. They usually go for an angiography and see the other patterns also. And next one is stable. Stable. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you are audible. Yes, sir. Sir. Yeah. audible sir. Because there was some. Yes, can we come to stable and non non ST elevation? Am I? Now these two points are very important for a clinical cardiologist and some persons who are not well known to in the echo or so. Now with stable angina. Eco can be normal despite a triple vessel disease. Why? Because we told you that what eco picks up is an ischemia or injury at the time of examination. So a patient with stable angina, his resting coronary blood supply is normal and that is why it may not show any wall motion abnormality as we showed you in the two cases within the emergency room. So what are the clinical implications of this? Sentence. Sometimes some of the clinicians and the patients, they think that ECO is the last word in cardiology. And if ECO is normal, they don't have any heart disease also. And they, and they may feel all sorts of it that there's nothing wrong. So whenever we get such patients, we always tell them that don't go with the idea that you have entirely no heart disease, but it can be normal also in a stationary angina. Similarly, in unstable angina, if there is no chest pain, it is an acute emergency unstable angina, but it can be normal if no chest pain. So the two important dictums are 
a wall motion abnormality that is a decrease of solid thickening in presence of chest pain is virtually diagnostic of a coronary artery disease and no regional wall motion abnormality in presence of a chest pain virtually excludes a coronary artery disease so these two statements are so important that we repeat take home messages a normal lv wall motion that is a normal lv a normal echo plus a normal ecg plus a no chest pain does not exclude cad because that is a resting blood flow is normal at any stable angina presence of a wall motion abnormality in presence of a typical or an atypical chest pain is virtually diagnostic of a cad there are always some caveats or so no regional wall motion abnormality in presence of chest pain virtually excludes a coronary artery disease so these are the general take home messages from this so what is so in these situations what is the option we don't we will not go into a detail of a stress echo because this is a entirely different subject or so but it is only based on the principle that when you give any stressor it increases the blood pressure and heart rate and this increase in the blood pressure and heart rate produces an increased oxygen demand on the patient or so and if it is not met by a supply then they develop certain echo and ecg changes so there is an imbalance between the supply and the demand because of it because of its stressor and here because of coronary artery restriction so this leads to certain changes so various stresses are there but for example what are most commonly used are a treadmill test and a dobutamine or a stress atropine stress echo those who cannot exercise and then we see for mainly see for easy changes and the wall thickening in these situations so the main objective of a stress echo in cad is that the symptoms are due to presence or absence of cad to determine the extent of the cad that how many wall motion abnormalities occur a prognostic certification and guide to management so that means there will be two a lot of stress echo but will will not going to detail because it is tally very different subject and you see here always the stress is given on a wall motion of the systolic thickening in a normal myocardial segment the systolic thickening increases by about 40 to 50% and as the disease progresses from akinesia hypokinesia this period the systolic thickening gradually decreases and other changes occur for example here you see you see this is up to this place there is a good systolic thickening but in a distal part of the septum there is a decreased systolic thickening as compared to other segment known as hypokinesia so again you see decreased systolic again you see what we showed you earlier there is a complete absence of a systolic thickening with of the factors or so and these are these are to like an aneurysm or so you see you see this is the normal myocardial segment and you see of the left ventricle a complete ballooning both in diastole and systole with a spontaneous contrast echo indicative of a very decreased lv function and this is what is a, a sort of a, a mural thrombus because it is believed when a thin segment appears thick think of a thrombus so these are the certain wall motion abnormalities where we see besides the wall motion we see also mainly the thickening or so so and you see you see here the this when you add a exercise echo to other modalities you get much more information regarding a prognostic information as compared to the earlier also so the exercise echo is a very good modality to be used then we come to the st elevation mi now you say the factors determining the extent of infarction or amount of myocardium produced by the occluded artery that is why led lesions are much more as compared to the circumflex the duration of ischemia the time to revascularization and the extent of collateral circulation all of these play a part in the factor determining the extent of infarction now a diagnosis of mi is usually based on history ecg and serum marker and believe me almost in about a large percentage of cases 
these three are sufficient to give a diagnosis of ST elevation, MI also, they are sufficient. But each has got some limitations and where echo plays a part. For example, a classical chest pain sometimes can be non-ischemic. There can be a typical chest can turn out to be ischemia, like elderly persons, women and diabetes, as we saw in cases with the in the emergency room. Then there are various causes of chest pain, which can be ischemic and non-ischemic. There are hundreds of causes of non-cardiac, and there are many causes of a cardiac one. For example, if you see here, the aorta is enlarged and there is a membrane here. So this was a case of aortic dissection. So this aortic dissection can present as a chest pain and can be, can be misdiagnosed as myocardial infarction also. So just to show that other causes also, and you see a, a, a mitral wall prolapse, this is anterior leaflet. Chest pain also. Then you see this patient, he was admitted, he referred for with tachycardia and some chest pain, and then if you see there was 130 was heart rate, but you see there are multiple clots into the right atrium, and hence, instead of an ischemic heart disease, this gave us a diagnosis of a presence of an acute pulmonary embolism which presented with a tachycardia and a chest pain. So these are just some of the examples to give you. and and this is a saddle embolism at the bifurcation of the right and the left pulmonary and the pulmonary artery. So this is about the about this thing about the chest pain. And as you know, almost about 40% of the patients coming to the emergency room have a non-diagnostic ECG. It is well known. The ECG may be non-diagnostic. That is why you go on taking an ECG after every half an hour or one hour. And as the time passes, it increases in, in increase the frequency. Similarly, the serum markers may take some time to act. So that sometimes when there is an atypical chest pain, you are that the history is not suggestive. The serum markers take time to delay, where vital time is lost in doing a primary angioplasty or any other measurement either. So in those patients, the echo is an indispensable tool in cases of acute MI with a sensitivity of about 90 to 95 percent. Patient between ECG and and 0 for second or more than one fourth of the proceeding R wave and these are the leads which can we tell you which which when you do an ECG you always see the echo very carefully in those segments to see whether there is a good correlation or not. Now, sometimes a problem comes, whether in the vault or in the emergency, a patient may be having a previous myocardial infarction. You do don't know whether it is an acute infarct or an old infarct also. So that is a diagnostic problem. So in, in, in acute infarct, initially, within few hours, the wall thickness is normal. Though the systolic thickening may be abnormal and there is an enzyme rise. Now, in the old infarct, according to the natural history, the, the injured myocytes are gradually replaced by thickening and fibrosis. So, there is a marked thinning of segments. Here, the, there is no significant thickening, marked thickening of segments, increased echogenesis due to fibrosis of scarring, and there is no rise of enzyme. For example, this is the uh, this is like a remodeling that a normal patient the infarct then shows elongation. Then you see the a remodeling in the form of KD shape and size. And here you see a patient. This is a every a fibrotic scar is always very echogenic. So you see this is the IVF. This is an zero lateral wall, and there is a complete fibrosis and loss of thickening of the interventricular septum indicating that this is not a recent infarct, it is an old infarct also. Because the fibrosis and all this takes some time to develop. So by an echo, you see the enlargement of this LV remodeling and the presence of a gross fibrosis, this highly echogenic is indicative of an old infarct. So sometimes this problem can occur. So the summary of diagnosis can be examined every scan plane 
केयरफुल सी फॉर ऑल कार्डियर सेगमेंट एंड सी फॉर एस्टोलिक थिकनिंग तो ऑलवेज सेगमेंट फ्रॉम द वेरियस कैन क्लेम्स ऑल्सो एंड देन यू गेट ए यू नेवर मिस अ डायग्नोसिस नो फ्यू वर्ड्स अबाउट आर वी ऑप्शन अबाउट 30 परसेंट केसेस to the rv branch can develop an rv infarction so always try to see in these cases and you suspect when you did in serial mi and possibly not always a tried of hypotension precipitated by nitrates because they reduce the preload and further produce an hypotension raise the jvp and clear lung failure cluster thing and that is why our policy is that all patients all patients especially in inferior wall mi must undergo the right pericord precordial leech as a routine or so especially the v4r where we can find a, a an rva a, a st elevation or so so this is the some of the presentation of these patients of inferior mi so they must be looked after because their prognosis sometimes can be bad so they present with rv enlargement are we dysfunction because the myocardial like like you have lv dysfunction in anterior myocardial infarction so are we dysfunction is in is associated with this right ventricular wall motion apex is usually less involved because the apex is of the rv is supplied by the left anterior descending so that this is the this page but otherwise you see with this history you can get a a this these manifestations get an rv infarction and they then because they then increase with the ra pressure the ivc may be a loss because the ivc drains into the ra and when the ra pressure is a loss ivc has to drain against and increase the pressure so it is larger and one one clinical suspicion is there whenever you get an inferior mi suspect if there is hypoxemia present this hypoxemia even if you have missed rv in person one one important point is that because of this mi when there is an increased ra pressure this increased ra pressure opens up the patent foramen ovale so there is a right to left shunt and you get an hypoxemia because of the right to left shunt and these are some of the measures to to treat them maintain rv feeling pp anodes we don't really use we do, don't give them nitrates or diuretics because their preload is already less so their output will be will be different also so for example this patient you see this is the anterior wall this is inferior wall and you see the basal and the mid segment of inferior wall show a completely absence of a decreased systolic thickening and there is a presence of a complete a kinase of inferior wall then in a four chamber view you see the rv is enlarged and there is a more wall motion abnormality of the basal and the mid segment as compared to the anterior you can see the anterior is contracting well but you see rv is rv is enlarged and here you see because of this there is a significant enlargement in ra that is as i mentioned that here you see again the apex is moving well and the mid and the basal portion is show the significant hypokinesia as associated with an increased ra size so this they gave us the diagnosis of a rv infarction so this is a few words about rv infarction always try to keep it in mind especially in inferior mi and always take a right ventricular leads also and the same patient you can see the ivc shows a decreased systolic thickening because it is it is draining into a into high pressure ra chamber also so all the signs were present so assessment of complication now we will not go into all the complications because of a because of the interest of the time or so but some of the important complications where there is an early recognition of an acute hemodynamic collapse you are not worried about some lv dysfunction some lv aneurysm or something all these things or so but you are more worried about here yeah, about the hemo, about the hypotension So a 60-year-old gentleman who suffered an extensive anterior wall MI was admitted to ICU, thrombolyzed and stabilized on day three. He suddenly deteriorates and goes into pulmonary edema and hypotension. Now, what is the likely cause? Is there a reinfarction, acute MI, or a ventricular septal rupture? 
And here you see, you see a, when a closed echo was done, here you can see a ventricular septal defect. You have to really look for it. It is most in the apical segment. You have where you see the heart is almost about 141, and you can see the fuse, the color flow going from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. So, so this gave us a diagnosis of a ventricular septal rupture, which is a very, very acute medical emergency. But unfortunately, very few persons try to tackle it out. So, either by surgery or by or call any other method. Another patient, you can see a ventricular septal defect here, and by a color flow mapping, you can see the flow going from the left ventricle to the right ventricle going from this area. So one should keep in mind this thing also. So occurs usually within the first week of infarct. Get murmur. Another patient, a stable post-MI patient who was recovering well, suddenly developed hypotension, shortly followed by a cardiac arrest and no arrhythmia no seat at that time. What would be the cause again? Reinfarction, acute MR, ventral septal rupture or a cardiac rupture. So because it occurred on the third and fourth day, sometimes you can see this is a parasternal long axis view, this is the inferior wall, and you can see there is a rupture of the wall, and the blood is going from the left ventricle into, into this pseudoaneurysm as a rupture. So it is occurs usually secondary to large transmural infarct, and sometimes it can lead to what is known as a pseudoaneurysm, and it is usually fatal, except sometimes in inferior MI, I don't know how this patient gave time for doing an echo because otherwise they go a, a, into a into a sudden cardiac arrest. So this is the how a rupture looks like. And as I said, they can go into a a pseudoaneurysm. Pseudoaneurysm is a contained rupture of free wall where it is it is contained by the pericardium, not by the myocardium also. So you see, this is the left ventricle, all pericardium, myocardium, but here you see. In a pseudo aneurysm, you see there is a, it is contained by the pericardium and no myocardial tissue are seen, and the entry point is very small as compared to the whole of the aneurysm. And here you see a patient, this is the, this is the whole is a pseudo aneurysm, and patient has a free wall rupture, which was contained by the pericardium and hypotensive, and this is an emergency situation which needs an immediate surgery possible. Again, you see, this is the neck, and this is the whole of the pseudoaneurysm. A big sort of a problem in these cases. A 48-year-old gentleman, chronic smoker, who was a known case of COPD, presented with sudden onset of breathless and hypotension. Clinical examination revealed bilateral extensive ronchi, ECD showed acute inferior MI. What was the likely diagnosis? Because he was an old case of COD. Was it an acute exacerbation of COPD? Is it an acute LV or something else? So the X now is gave a complete diagnosis. There is a partial rupture of the papillary muscle. A complete rupture of the papillary muscle is usually fatal within few minutes. So this is an anterior mitral reflex, and you see the moving mass. That that moving mass is a partial rupture of the of the head of the uh, papillary muscle. And on a three on a on a screening on a chance esophageal echo, you can see a completely flail anterior leaflet with a with a ruptured partial head ahead of the head of the papillary muscle and the presence of a severe mitral regurgitation. So remember, it is a, a, wherever an acute MI developing holosystolic murmur, sometimes it may be soft or so hard cell hemodynamic color, think of it. That is more common in posterior medial papillary muscle as anterior lateral because a posterior lateral papillary muscle has got a single arterial supply, while anterior lateral has got a double arterial supply. So it is more common in the posterior medial papillary muscle. Now, sometimes the patient comes with hypotension. You are always fed up also. The body, the cause of this, it was nothing. You see, there is hardly any IBC. This the IVC is completely collapsed. It is not at all moving anything. So this patient has a marked hypovolemic hypotension or a collapse. You see, a, a spontaneous collapse, IVC was hardly 4 to 5 millimeters. So this patient required only the fluid 
and that is why whenever we do an emergency echo we always see the ivc and the feeling pressure so this is another just a routine case also now you remember these patients require a very urgent echo early detect when is doubtful diagnosis hypotension heart failure unexplained dyspnea chest pain the left bundle branch block also so they require an early echo as a trick as a root other cases may take 24 hours but these require an urgent echo then some sort of a post mi so that whenever this this there are various mass markers extent this all all of us is known that the degree of wall motion abnormality and the lv function have a very significant impact on the prognosis if the wall motion score is more than 1.7 to 2 so one of these are you know here you see the patient dictated with persistent tachycardia 128 multiple coronary involvement very very poor lv function a, a very marked involvement of the part possibly right coronary and the, the anterior septal and possibly the circumflex so this patient is high risk it is a very individual function for 10 to 15% and you see a marked spontaneous contrast echo so again a very poor prognostic factor so these are some of the reasons for the prognostic factor and systolic volume index so these are important and systolic volume index you see it is a simple but most powerful stand alone marker of lv remodeling and repeated hospitalization and these are the upper limit is 43 ml in any case you are always detecting a you are doing a simpson method to detect an lv function where you always detect an end systolic volume and for example here it is 84 to 88 so this is the average with a bulk with a body size for the rate come to 52 a very high risk case then the systolic function is still very big talk a very markedly increased la pressure and a restrictive feeling can is a very poor prognostic factor also then we were left exercise at some stage we were we were ignoring rv function but a beautiful paper came out in 2002 where they had anterior myocardial infarction and of this 79 patients had an rv dysfunction and they found that all thing whether death cardiovascular disease everything was much more marked in patient with rv dysfunction since then we have we have made it a point that whenever we get any myocardial infarction whether by visual impression or by simple tapsi and tdi we see the rv function because they have got a prognostic impact or so so now a therapy it also plays a very significant role in therapy so remember i will point out here that whenever you get a patient of a mi with murmur i will tell you the cause later on so this is all all the thing known to you but one important thing and we faced once was a persistent hypotension despite giving dopamine and 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 dopamine this was a 58 year old individual had an anterior septal mi developed hypotension put on an iv dopamine drip no response to bp dopamine concentration further increased no response iv dop iv from dopamine and dopamine added no significant response the patient had a tachycardia and hypotension persisted and the systolic murmur was noted in the aortic area and when the echo was done now the the echo showed that there was the there was increased the lvot velocity and the gradient and this is the reason that what happened that when the the lvot is formed by the by the septum and the mitral leaflet also so when there is a when there is a it is more this lvot gets obstructed because of the compensatory hyperkinesis of the ivs and this increases the lvot gradient and and whatever flow goes in lvot goes into the aorta so by giving increasing this you are further producing a more obstruction also by increasing the by the inotropic agents also so you see so this is a lv this is the this is the same of the anterior mitral leaflet and this is a, a basal hypertrophy similarly sometimes patients of an anterior mi 
they develop a compensatory hypercranial disc segment and then produces an LVOT obstruction. So that what whenever you again you see there was no sign but there was here. So whenever you get such patients, always do a always get an echo done because there there many many different they they need fuse beta blockers. Alpha agonist, but no inotrope. So in this patient, when we stop dopamine, dobutamine, gave them fluid sense of beta blocker, the BP came up also. So it is a new murmur with an unstable hyper, unstable hemodynamics in absence of an MR and the BSD. So sometimes take home message is that whenever you get a new systolic murmur in acute MI, think of a VSD, papillary muscle rupture, papillary muscle dysfunction, and acute LVOT obstruction. Lastly, a few words about viability before we finish. Whenever we get an ischemic LV dysfunction, it can be either because of an irreversible myocardial necrosis or myocardial staining or myocardial hibernation. Before viability was gained, for, gained importance, any patient coming with an LV dysfunction was completely was completely neglected, they thought that it is an irreversible myocardium. So a dysfunctional myocardium with reduced contractility, <laughs> that improves after restoration of corneal blood flow, is known as viability. And there are two main causes. One is a, one is a stunning, in which there is, a not, there is no myocardial infarction, but there is only a, a resting coronary flow is reduced and it, <laughs> and it tends to recover within a, within itself also when you get a good or a bad news you are suddenly stunned and then you recover so they automatically recover and nothing is to be done while a hyper a hibernating one is because of a critically stenosed artery and they need a revascularization otherwise they go into ischemic cardiomyopathy <coughs> and we do a dobutamine echo we'll not go into detail but one important study and these are some of the parameters response to dobutamine if a patient who has got stent myocardium, he improves at a low dose and continues to improve at a high dose because the coronary supply is normal. While a hibernating myocardium shows a wall motion abnormality at rest, a viable it improves and ischemia is again, again disturbed so that we can reduce. So this is known as a biphasic response. So the point of noting is that is just a portal slide long time back. There are some modifications to it now, but once there is a revascularization with viability, a survival is very good. If you continue to give medical therapy with viability, then the survival is decreased. And if you revascularize without viability, there's no problem, there's nothing to be done. In some of the corporate hospitals, it's still being done. We write in our report that there is a fibrosis and but and and there is a non-viable tissue but still they undergo revascularization. So simply remember that identifying a viable myocardium in an LV dysfunction is extremely important. So to summarize, ECO is extremely information in acute coronary syndrome, right from onset of symptom to discharge, not that only once up to discharge, helps in early diagnosis, early management thereby affecting the morbidity, mortality, and the implication of a normal echo has already been discussed with you that don't, don't get misled by a normal echo. It provides a incremental prognostic information, both in a long, long term or so. It guides therapy in hemodynamically compromised patients by providing complete anatomical and hemodynamic information. I always stress that every ER resident should be trained to at least for detective all motion abnormality if a patient comes in the night also. And like, and stress echo is something different and everything has got some limitations, a lack of exercise, multiple infarctions also. So I, I finish with that knowledge is a journey, not a destination. You may be any top nut in the world, but never think that your knowledge is complete. It is never complete. It is only a journey. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Parashat, sir. Thank you for your excellent lecture. Uh, now we can take some discussion or question for five to ten minutes, then we'll go for the next lecture. Uh,
we have got our panelists to ask let professor sajal banerji to speak for professor sajal banerji is here yeah yes sir good morning sir morning sir how are you sir bahut hai look like but i think your beard and everything needs to come out of it trimming and some black thing also so sir very very very, very, very strange to see rajya sultana ko now i think she has gone i see i thought she has got taken a retirement she and shahana i think both of them i took because they never respond to my emails yes please yes thank you sir you have given Sajal a very ji. nice very nice lecture particularly you have you have given very good emphasis on uh, ses uh, diagnosis in the emergency room uh, uh, the role of eco in the emergency room you have given the full emphasis and full details of the uh, activities by the cardiologist in a patient uh, with ses in emergency room particularly you have given very good idea regarding the uh, finding but uh, like uh, the wall muscle abnormality uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, other finding in the setting of acute coronary syndrome and particularly in acute myocardial infarction and uh, 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 you have given also a very good light on right ventricular infarction uh, we are really very very uh, uh, grateful to you for giving a full idea regarding uh, acute coronary syndrome uh, uh, and the role of echo uh, in a very short time but uh, in a very actually echo in emergency beautiful. room i know you are very good master and master oh. of master uh, uh, i know you very for a long time and uh, last of all you have given the right thing that the knowledge is a journey not a destination so we have given the uh, we have uh, uh, received the message from you that uh, knowledge is a journey not a destination so uh, thank of you uh, thank you and we are really uh, grateful and uh, delighted by your lecture uh, thank you sir uh, actually echo in the emergency echo in emergency echo in emergency room is itself a separate topic and all the cases which we had shown uh, they were actually missed that no that emergency room where the echo machine can go and one has to look and never get focus that i am dealing with only one thing you may get any other thing or so right, it is sir. always a very important thing in emergency is in emergency also sir thank right, you sir right sir so there is a question sir. for you sir how early regional wall motion abnormality can develop in 6 to 8 seconds experimentally it has been shown that within 6 to 8 beats and within 6 to 8 seconds these changes can can occur also and that is why sometimes when there is an acute discomfort is my cardiac contrast also but experimentally also they have found that within few seconds they get it also or after few beats they once it is an acute ischemia they may get immediately also very rare, very quickly but and in that's practice why we never we never depend upon ecg cardiac and then chest pain they may come much later also we have seen patients in whom the echo has been abnormal and the chest pain has come a little bit later on also but practically how soon we can detect the wall motion abnormality in our echo lab or in ccu the the thing is that you are always never sitting in the echo in the emergency <laughs> with a machine by the time you get a call it's already about 15 20 minutes have already passed but theoretically they say about 8 to 10 seconds but it by the time you get a call by the time you get a emergency there you the 20 minutes are finished now the two cases which i showed one we when we gave a sort of a hand grip or so as soon as they just as soon as they develop the chest pain immediately we could show a wall motion abnormality so as quickly as possible you can show a wall motion abnormality as soon as you, as the patient chest pain develops also Yes, sir. There is role of uh, portable echo is very important in the emergency. Yes, yes. That means every hospital now. I think uh, we have seen we have seen Professor Vijay Raghavan's hospital, which contains a large number of machines. Every hospital now has got a one machine. Almost 
patient in the coronary care unit and one more portable is usually kept in the echo room so that because most of the cases the emergency room is down below so rather than frequently getting the machine but one extra machine is always kept for emergency and the and the emergency room coronary care unit then cath lab because we get so many patients from the cath lab also who develop a hemoperitoneal mortality which i think with with which ragman will will tell you so there are multiple at least two three machines or so depending upon the size of the hospital right sir stand by machine yeah so there is there is a question for you uh, how to how to uh, give the hand grip is there any specific uh, measures or any specific rule or uh, how to use this hand grip not there? audible sir is there any pardon no sir is there is any heard. okay sir Uh, now are you audible uh, am i audible to you sir no uh, now you are audible yes sir uh, how can we give a hand grip test is there any specific rule that how much no, no, we I, give i what i told you that that we used to do many many years back yes sir we normally don't now in more some of us we are not we are not doing so much of myocardial contrast echo or so or so but sometime because when there is a when there is an atrial chest pain now if you take a if you take pain clinics in a in a western countries they have got a coronary ct there in the near the emergency they have got myocardial contrast echo stress test also so normally there is no thing also but you just press it and try to see if the patient develops a chest and sometimes the chest can be not developed so why is somebody when he is pressing the fingers or hand you keep your echo on the on the scan plane don't wait for the chest pain to occur because chest pain occurs later on ischemia occurs earlier also so and now even even in this patient suppose we had not induced some chest discomfort if the history is very suggestive there are coronary risk factors also we still try to keep them and and see what happens this was just to show that how much important sudden changes can occur from a normal to an abnormal echo thank you sir i think we can move to our Now, one, second one, lecture one, one, one second yes sir large number of echoes which dr rash showed that at the right time there was somebody with the machine there at the bedside otherwise yes. many of the echoes would not have been captured and the reason the, the the talk went in so interestingly mainly because the emergency echoes could be captured at the correct time and we have actually two portable echoes one for the wards and one for the icu the cath lab and the er because of this we could capture many of those patients yes. at the right time and that's what dr rashra alluded to catch it at the right time so that you make the right diagnosis thank you thank sir. you sir thank you sir thank you for our next lecture will be given by dr gobindo vijay ragavan is the Sir, dean of pros you did yes, a very sir. good you did a, a good thing to me you made yes, my sir. talk before vijay ragavan nobody yes, should speak after vijay ragavan speak ah, <laughs>